mountains of unbelief. Lord, move the mountains of doubt. Fill us with your faith, God. May we see the way you see. May we hear the way you hear. May we come into agreement with those things in heaven, Lord. And it will be on earth as it is in heaven. Align our hearts today, Jesus. Align our thoughts. Align our wills with yours, with heaven, Jesus, this day. Hallelujah. That you will be glorified in the earth, Jesus, as you are in heaven. You will be glorified in your people, Lord, as we live and move and have our being in you. Apart from you, we can do nothing, Lord. So we choose this day, Lord, to walk with you. We choose this day, Lord, to believe with you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
everything in lives are healed and hope is found here now Jesus you change everything and chains fall and fear bow here now Jesus you change everything in lives are healed and hope is found here now Jesus you change everything show us your glory show us your glory in wonder and surrender we fall down show us your glory show us your glory let every burning heart be holy ground Of his deepest, of his wider covers us, of his 
fierce, his love is strong and it's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild and it's waking hearts to lie. Yeah, his love is deep, his love is wide and it covers us. His love is fierce, his love is strong and it's furious. His love is sweet, his love is wild and it's waking hearts to lie. Waking hearts to lie. the point of weary is your burden weighing heavy is it all too much to carry let me tell you about my Jesus do you feel that empty feeling cause shame's done all the stealing and you're desperate for some healing let me tell you about my Jesus His love is strong and His grace is free. The good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. dreams and wasted years until the past had disappeared let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could who can work it all for your good let me tell you about my Jesus he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my Jesus, yes, his love is strong and his grace is free. Good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus and let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah, 
the price for all my guilty Who would care that much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus Who would take my cross to Calvary Pay the price for all my guilty Who would care that much about me Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my jesus yes his love is strong and his grace is free the good news is i know that he can do for you what he's done for me so let me tell you about my jesus and let my jesus change your life Rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Yes, it's your endless love pouring down. New now life begins with you, your grace. Oh, your grace so free, washes over me. You have made us new now, life begins with you. 
washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you It's your endless love Pouring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you And we're free, free Forever we're free So come join the song of all the redeemed Yes, we're free, free Forever, amen When death was arrested and my life began Yes, we're free, free Forever we're free So come join the song of all the redeemed Yes, we're free, free Forever, amen When death was arrested and my life began When death was arrested and my life began When death was arrested and my life began We thank you for the grace of the living God. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that comes and inhabits the praise of your people. We are free because of the work you have done, my Lord, upon the cross. By faith, we receive your work. And because of that, oh God, we're new creations. And the old things are passing away and all things are becoming new. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would do what you want to do with us today. We give you permission, Jesus, for you're the head of the church. It is you that we follow. It is you we glorify. It is you who is exalted high above all things. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. better? <laughs> okay. A um, couple of quick announcements. Don't forget Ember's Tuesday night at 6. Um, we're watching good things happen, of course, always, but Six o'clock. There's a couple sign up seats in the back. One is for a Bible study that will be starting on January 19th that Pastor Paul is doing. Okay? And um, just a second, I will, if I can.
the title of the Bible says it is God's redemptive plan for ages. A precursor studies to the book of Revelation. Okay? All right. This is not going to give you a, his understanding of when he's coming or what astrological thing he, you want to argue about. That is not what he wants to do. He wants to teach you the things out of the Old Testament speaking of the first and second coming of Christ. Now, some of you can't make it. If you might work nights that night, it will be recorded, filmed, and online. And the paperwork you can get at the office, okay? As of now, it's eight weeks. But those who might want more, they can have more. So you can sign up online or you can sign up on the back table. We also need some people to volunteer on a rotation basis for embers and child care. So people with children can come and participate. Okay? And so there's two sign-up sheets. Grab them on the way out. Sign up. Okay? Prayer tonight at 6 o'clock. Amen? Okay? And so um, I don't want that. Why did it do that? Oh, you, you thing, you. Let's try it again. I don't want to get started. I want to go back to the page I wanted. Almost there. I got it. Maybe. Okay. Got it. Let's pray. <laughs> I've never seen your iPad do that before. Heavenly Father, as we come in the beginning of a new year, we ask that your spirit would speak to us and your goodness of your word would explain things to our hearts. And what you desire most from us, oh God. And so, Father, release your goodness over our city and over our region. And, we, Lord, we desire an awakening of your church and those that don't know Jesus in 2022. In Jesus' name, amen. I was sitting there in prayer this morning. And then you begin to realize how old you are. 28 years ago is the first Sunday sermon we had on 1st of January at Zion Christian Ministry. So I realized how old I was then because it was not hard in math to figure 20 off of what I am now. Okay. <laughs> and <clears throat> as 28 years doing the same thing, and if I was to write down how many sermons I wrote on Sunday and Tuesday and Sunday nights, and all of a sudden now it's in the thousands and thousands. But the Word of God is new every day. And so when you start out, you know, you're a young pastor, and you think you know what you're doing, but you really don't. And then you wish you knew what you were doing back then, as you know now, but then hopefully in a year from now I'll know more. Because being a pastor is not your perfection. It's always growing into the perfection of Christ. So I think I had time to think about and pray this morning as I entered in for this new year. So the title of the message today is What You Choose in 2022. 
And usually, I ask the Lord for a prophetic word or something for the year ahead to give on January, the first sermon of the month, of the new year. And I felt that something that was shared with me by another pastor by the name of Eric Reed that was given to me by Joey as he, where he finds things I don't know. <laughs> um, but it's a neat little uh, saying. You want to put it up, Joe? Most of us have chosen heaven over hell. Amen? But not many have, of us have chosen heaven over earth. When I heard that a week or so ago, whatever it is, it just stuck in my heart. And um, I know how zealous I was 28 years ago, and, and there's somebody here that knew me longer than most of you in those years, and my zealousness, and my fire, my knockdown fences, and whatever I would try to do in my heart because of my love for Christ and what he did for me and what he saved me in. And so, not that I'm tempered, but I hope that I can share today as I prayed and thought about things I've been privileged in the year of 1994 knowing in a personal way this love that God has for you. He loves you. And the way I learned it is not something I wish anyone in this room would have to experience. And then I, it went even farther today is I thought about how much Christ loved the Father at the same time, how much Christ loved us. And it was a gift of Christ to us that I began to understand in 94, which I have not fully comprehended and probably won't until the day of glory, how much the Father loves us. And that day after my son died, when I asked the Lord why, he told me, the pain you feel in your chest, this grieving moment is what I felt when I gave you my son. And it was a point I never really grabbed as a Christian at that moment. It was out of this love for us that the Father felt this pain. It's a real pain. If any of you grieved over anyone's loss, family, brother, whoever, mother, father, grandparents, it's a real grieving moment, and the Scripture tells us that we are to mourn. There is a season of mourning, a season of rejoicing, and it's real. And so, therefore, this love for us is hard to comprehend when you experience that. Okay? And so when you've experienced this love, just a little bit that we may have experienced in our salvation, it's hard to then see how this saying but not many of us have chosen heaven over earth after we've chosen heaven over hell. And that seems like an easy thing to choose if you really get a picture of hell, get a picture of heaven. So there isn't too many who really gained the revelation of Jesus Christ want to choose hell. There are some. Why, I don't know. And why people choose what they choose, we don't really know the heart of all, but only the Father does. But today's message is, what has God been doing and what does he want for us as a believing church to do? See, Scripture says heaven is past, heaven's here forever, but the earth is passing away. And so we can watch the news, we can watch everything that's going on and see everything in turmoil, everything going on, but heaven doesn't change. And I'm hoping to give you some scriptures because we've watched some mighty things specifically over the last three or four months. People being healed, people being saved, people being baptized. Seeing people who are supposed to be in the grave aren't in the grave. We've seen a touch of heaven, not in the fullness of what could be, 
but something maybe to get our attention. I really believe Jesus is always trying to get our attention. He's always trying to, hello, <laughs> I'm here. And we're so busy at times, and we are so stuck in some things in our head that we miss him. I know I have. I know you get busy and you're doing things, and he might give you something just slide a little word in. See, Christ doesn't yell at us to get our attention. He'll just a silent little voice. He doesn't need our approval to make him God. He is God. He doesn't need that from us. So when he talks to his kids, he just says, this is what I'm saying. And because he doesn't seem to be very forceful about it, sometimes we might not take it too serious. Okay. Yeah. Okay, God, I think I know that. And then we move on. But what does it mean if we are to choose heaven in this coming year over earth? You know, they're telling us to ice caps are melting and Miami's going to be underwater and, you know, Russia may be ready to drop the bomb in Ukraine. We could go on and on and on about everything going on in the world. Years ago, when I first got saved, he told me something because then people started talking about the coming back of Jesus and when is he coming. And I began to read different things and there's many different theological possibilities more than I can even pronounce. And you know what he said? It's all going to pan out. <laughs> and maybe that was for me because I'm too simple-minded to understand everything. But what he was saying to me, why are you focused on what you know will happen instead of focusing on what you need to do? So when he said it's all going to pan out, means I'm coming back. Be focused on what you're to do here and be busy about it and don't be wrapped up in what, when. Because it says, Jesus told us, nobody knows. I mean, we skipped that. So there's people not in this church today because they thought he was coming back in 2020 on September certain date. And because I didn't believe them, and I didn't honor what they thought was coming, and it didn't happen, they couldn't stay because they were wrong. Instead of saying, forgive me, I took the bait, I, you know, I remember telling the Lord to come back after my son died. I said, come back. You know what he said? Get behind you, Satan. Well, that's a fine how you do. And what was he saying? For what you want to deal with in your pain, you don't care how many don't make it. See, we get so wrapped up in the me, me, me factor that we forget that God is taking the big factor over the whole earth. So when he told me, what, you want me to come back so you can be with your son when he's going to be there forever with you? So you, you won't be in pain. Do you care how many would not make heaven? Or you just care about yourself? Well, I didn't like the answer. <laughs> but it was truth. See, what we don't want to do is handle truth. Truth doesn't always make us feel good. Because usually it's going opposite of what's in our head or what we're thinking or how we think God's going to do it or what God's up to. And my heart for you is that we would know heaven is there. Thursday morning prayer, Pastor and I were talking. He has a friend who's been a missionary all his life and Pastor's done many trips with him overseas, and they take material into churches in different parts of the world.
he can't really travel now, but he goes into Africa because he can get in. And he has, and Pastor has written some of these programs, these Bible studies that they've done and, and all of that in this missionary group. And he was telling him about going into Nigeria. And if you don't follow what's going on in Nigeria, there is constant war between another faith and Christianity. And in that other faith, they are killing kids and women and raping and pillaging and all of that. And the church, one church he works with has lost half of its members either through murder, women being stolen, children being grabbed up and put into an army to fight for the other faith. And so he has these 20 different programs and Bible studies he could give them to train them up in the Word. And there's one thing they want to know, and they pick one study. You ready? What's heaven like? They want to know about heaven. Now, they're not as, probably don't have as many Bibles as we got or access to Internet or any stuff that we got. Why do they want to know about heaven? Because it is that is what they have to hang on to in the persecution they live in. And they want to know because they know people who have already gone on who believe. But we sometimes don't look at heaven that way. We're wrapped up into a world that is passing away. I had a lot of things on my mind because as I've thought about the last, from August on, and how many people in my own personal family I've lost. Sometimes you get tired of getting the phone call. Well, how do you do it, Pastor? My focus is on heaven. Do I grieve? Yes. Do I mourn? Yes. But I can't live in it because I live in heaven. Because Ephesians tells me that I sit in heavenly places. How did the first century church function? In such turmoil and upside downness, how did John continue in his faith when his brother was the first one who was martyred? Because they knew there was something more than this earth. They understood that the God of heaven sent his son so that we would have eternal life and what was meant to get rid of sin that is in us and to walk that out in faith. So we have something I believe the Lord put on my heart for the coming year is what do we choose? Do we choose Christianity that just makes it comfortable so that we'll be comfortable? 28 years of pastoring, as I start to 28 as a senior pastor, is that there's always this conversation that we have to have how to make it work. Now listen to this. How to make it work. How to make it work for you. How to make sure we don't offend you. Make sure we have the right studies for you. Are you listening yet? It's about you. Well, this coming year, it ain't going to be about you. It's going to be about him. Because, see, he cares more for you than you realize. He loves you more than I can ever give you. But my prayer for my this year, that I would have this love for you that would be beyond my understanding of love. Tending sheep can cause many men to quit the pastorate. Serious. But I asked God this morning, give me this love that you experienced in me in 94, that you loved us so much, you gave your only begotten son. I want that. So no matter what you guys do, doesn't matter. Because you don't answer to me. You answer to heaven. And who sits there? And if I can do that, then maybe I can see Jesus exalted. The whole purpose of a message today is to see somebody exalted that is deserving of it. 
not a church, not a denomination, but a king who will give you scriptures to tell us how we are to be. The Apostle Paul was murdering Christians before he got saved. Okay? Because he was so zealous for God that he believed he was doing the right thing. See, we can believe we're doing the right thing for God when it isn't even the right thing. He was zealous. Can you imagine the reunion he had with Stephen? As he, the clothes of those stoning him were at Paul's feet. And Stephen looked up and saw the throne of God, Jesus, stand up. And they stoned him. And then Paul realized what Stephen saw was real. Because then he met the Lord on the road. Are you ready to this? We're all going to be shifted in our realities, people. We're all going to be shifted in what we really see here when we get home and go, whoa, did I think I had it all together? But this is what Paul wrote to the Philippians. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He had to deal with what he did. You understand? He had to deal with the people he threw in prison, the ones he murdered, because he was doing a zealous thing for God. So when I reflect back 28 years of pastoring, I know I failed many times. You do. And you, boy, you beg for grace. Because see, I don't answer to you. I answer to Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you. I don't know who your bosses are. But I know mine is righteous and pure. And he knows every thought I've ever had and everything I've ever done. Praise God for the blood of Jesus. So here's Paul saying, I haven't got it yet, but I'm going to go for it. i got to leave behind what I was, and i got to go after this call. And you say, well, he was an apostle. Well, you have to know the word of God says everyone in this room are called, if you're a believer. We're all called to do different things for Jesus, whatever they might be. In the same passage, then he gives us what really is important in Chapter 3, verse 20, for our citizenship is in heaven and from which we so eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. When you are born again, you're now a citizen of heaven. And we know under our Constitution, if because I was born here, I now am a citizen of the United States. Kind of interesting, huh? And so in most nations, wherever you're born is that Nation is where you get your passport, and that's who you belong to, that nation. But news to you is you've all been, if you, let me look around. I think all of you have been born here in this country, okay? But now if you're born again, you're born into another nation. See, because we still live here doesn't mean we're really a part of this place anymore. We're to do the work of God. Because my citizenship is in heaven. One thing he's put on my heart is that we would become a congregation that comes into this building not with what we can get, but who we can worship. See, 
A couple of weeks ago, someone was worshiping. I won't give the details of their healing because it's personal. <laughs> and we're the part of her body that got healed. But no one prayed for her. We're just worshiping, and she was just having some pain. And she was tired of the pain because it interfered with her worship. So she just boldly said to God, God, I can't take it. Take the pain. I want to worship you. Pain left. Then she sit down and tells me that this is what happened. No one laid hands on her. See, when Jesus comes in the room, he does what he does. We sometimes want him to do before we invite him in the room. So what would happen to a congregation that showed up to give him glory, praise, honor, and he comes into the room, then who he is is what manifests. People get delivered. People get healed. People get saved. Life comes because he is alive. Sometimes we get things reversed because we're in such need. He knows your need. He knows everything about you. But he wants something called surrender. I want you to know, he says, that I am here for you. He wants us to know that. And he just shows up. So you're a citizen. So in the citizenship of heaven, you should have guidelines for which how you should be a citizen. So God lays down the, the book. Okay. Now, you're a son of God in Romans. I love it. You're now a son of God, and I love part. Oh, and you get to reign with me. And oh, I'm just going, what? Last week I talked about the fact that if we get rid of this Laodicean spirit that's over our city and over our nation, that we will sit with him on the throne. Those are promises of heaven. That's part of your citizenship. That comes with your citizenship. So then he tells us some of the things he wants us to do so we can walk as citizens of heaven. When you travel overseas, you understand how important citizenship is. Because you know, because I want to go back. I'm praying to go back. I want to go one more time, at least, to Kamchatka. But I know I could get in trouble over there. <laughs> I know KGB could come and say hi. And then, I, but you know what it is? But I got a blue b book that will allow me to go to the American embassy to get me out because of my citizenship. Maybe not right away, but might get me out. Okay? Praise God for that blue passport. But I have another passport. It says I'm marked and sealed by the Holy Spirit. And now all the heavens knows that I'm a Christian. And if you are, all heavens know. And all darkness knows where your citizenship lies. Because you're marked. As soon as you confess, there it is. So then he now wants to give us some guidelines on how we might go after this heaven thing on earth. Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. What? Hasn't Jesus seen we can make a lot of money on the market? <laughs> what is wrong with that guy? Lord, give me the proper when to buy, when to sell. Oh, I know, Bitcoin. All these different things where we can... He says, don't do that. Why? Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. It's not wrong having investments. It's not wrong taking care of your finances. It's not wrong. 
But where does your treasure lie? But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Ah, oh, man. This, you know, this is coming out of the Sermon on the Mount, and this is not really good for American Christianity. Where does your treasure lie, see? It isn't that he doesn't want to give you good things, because he does, because he's a good God. But if you're a pursuer of something above him, now you're wrong. Dead wrong. Ooh, that's the wrong voice. No, you might be dead wrong if you pursue something other than Christ. He, he wants to provide. That's what he says. But he's telling you ahead of time, if you put your treasures of what's on earth, you will not receive the full treasure of heaven. I've seen some awesome things over the last two or three weeks in ministry. And some of them I may never see again. But we did what we were supposed to do. I can't wait. Because of what maybe the Lord allowed me and Pastor Paul to do for somebody. It wasn't us. We just happened to be there. We just happened to ask the right question and then invite Jesus to fix it. That's treasure. I saw something. Someone sent me a message. It was a long weekend. I think it was yesterday. Somebody that Paul and I have been able to minister to over the last months. And it was sent to me as they sat holding hands and they got married. And when they came, there was no way. And the joy of their life was my treasure. The joy of what they were saying and how God had healed their hearts and healed their relationship. And they knew, and they just knew that it was time. And the person sent it to me, the video of them sharing their joy. Didn't get any earthly treasure out of it. Didn't want any earthly treasure out of it. Because we don't charge. But I got treasure out of it. If you saw the video and knew the story, it is a mighty miracle of God. I mean, beyond anything in this room, you can even think how much God healed them. It blew my mind. Of course, a little mind is easy to blow. <laughs> Where's the treasure lie? Did you know that you were his treasure? That's why he died. Did you know he, you were his treasure? He saw every one of you as his treasure. The son goes, that's how much my father loves them. They're a treasure to his heart. So then he comes along and says, now where's your treasure? Is your treasure back to me? Scripture says he loved us before we loved him. Scripture says that he knew us before we knew him. He was always after us. And this is how we live with a heavenly perspective in 1 Corinthians 2. But it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Sometimes we don't see right away what God's going to give us. But he has such joy to give us. Why would he hold back from us when he gave his only begotten son? 
He gave the highest gift. So why would he hold back from us? He won't. But the only way you're going to know is get out of the flesh and get into the spirit. The only way you're going to know is the spirit of God searches these things out, and then God comes and brings them to us. Because verse 12 says, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So if you're born again, you have the spirit of God connected to your spirit, man. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. So now you have an opportunity to connect to the things of heaven by the spirit of God. You get to enter in with the Father in the work on earth to bring joy to everyone you ever run into. Or you bring the worldly perspective. Because that says here, we haven't received that spirit of the world. What is that spirit of the world? Well, in Ephesians chapter 2, it talks about the dark one. The one you all sat under at one time that now you don't sit under. And that spirit used to run us and tell us the way we behave is okay. It's okay to hate somebody, okay to, to go and do anything you want to do as long as it makes you happy. My generation grew up with this lie. Well, what we do ain't hurt nobody. That was a hippie movement. I'm getting high, it's okay. I ain't hurt nobody till you ran over somebody. So homes were broken and families were destroyed. So children would grow up without any hope. But see, we bought that lie. We really weren't hurting anybody, but we were hurting ourselves and not counting all the people that loved us. So God says, I've given you something other than the worldly spirit. And so today's message is, what do we do? Somebody's happy. <laughs> I know we have to live here, okay? And Jesus knows you have to live here. You got it? But he also gives you something to live here with. But if your treasure is not up there, you live for something down here, and the Spirit can't work in your life. Can't. They don't mix. Get some gasoline, put some water in it, and see what happens. Then put it in your car and see how far you go. <laughs> and I see some people here know more mechanics than I do. Go ahead and see what happens when you got water in your oil and what it does to your engine. Oh, I blew a head gasket, and it's everywhere now. <laughs> it don't work. So why do we think that we can mix the spirit of the world and the spirit of Jesus? It ain't going to work. But somehow we think if we can balance it out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> we all are on that trampoline, that high wire act. Well, we're going to walk in spirit, and we're going to walk in the spirit of the world, and somehow we won't fall off. Oh. Jamie comes along and just goes, Seek. <laughs> well, where's God? Well, you've been running with a mixture. It don't work. Well, does he know how hard it is down here? Does Jesus really know? Uh, it says in Hebrews, he faced every temptation. And because he faced every temptation, he has concern what you go through. He knows. He understands. He, he knows exactly what you're facing. And ready for this? He knows what you're going to face before you face it. Because he is the spirit of prophecy. 
He is outside of time, and he's looking at everything that's going on. And dude, we can get mad at him and say, well, why do those people die? Why do bad things happen to good people? Because the world is fallen. It is sin. We weren't supposed to die. And he without sin cast the first stone. Remember that one? And they all dropped their stones and walked away. Then he looked at the woman caught in adultery and said, no sin, no more. Emma. I'm waiting for the tongue's interpretation to come out of that girl any moment now. <laughs> and my premise is this. What will we choose and then what fruit will come from it? What are we missing? Why are we not seeing the things that we know are available through Christ Jesus? Is he lacking? Has he come up short? Is he on vacation at times when we need him? Sometimes it feels that way. And he knows it feels that way for your heart. Do you ever wonder how Jesus knows what death is if he has always lived eternal? He had a stepdaddy, didn't he? Joseph? We know he was in there in the beginning of the gospel. Where the dickens was he when ministry came? No mention of him. You know he wasn't there because when Jesus was crucified, he turned to John and said, take care of my mom. Where was Joseph? Joseph had died. He, he knew what it was to have an earthly daddy die on him and the pain it caused his brothers and sisters and his mother. See, he knows what death is. He knows what we go through when we lose somebody. So he's the only one who can come and really comfort He's the only one that can really step in because he has experienced everything, but he comes at it with righteousness and a true spirit to heal us. But see, when we live totally in the now, in the flesh, we miss everything going on in the supernatural. You know, it says that we have angels that come with our salvation. Okay. They're here. You're here. They're here. We can't see them. You might experience them. But they're here. So he, Paul gives us an understanding of sometimes where our focus is, shouldn't be, and where we need to focus. Second Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is built for a moment, is working for us far more exceedingly eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For things which are seen are temporal, but things which are not seen are eternal. So when you're bound to the world, you're living in a temporal moment that's going to go away, and you're missing the eternity. So when Pastor shared about his missionary friend and when he goes to Africa, that those who don't have all the knowledge we have, don't have all the instruments that we have, but they have Christ, and they're dying for the gospel, their hope is heaven. Because their world isn't good. So when, they, when we went to Mozambique and the joy of building a well becomes the village's excitement, they're not packing the water on their head anymore every day. They can go and pump the well. 
And we're, well, we're civilized over here. But they got more of Jesus and his miracles than we do. Why? Because they're living not in the temporal, but in the eternal. They know spirits. They know the unseen world. They know about witch doctors. I read an article that the whole world is shifting after the paganism of Rome and its fall of Christianity rose up. That now the, this is what this author said. Now the world's going back to paganism. It is. Why did Harry Potter make so much money? Why? Oh, they're just having fun, no. I remember our youth pastor at the time went to see it, and there was a kid that went into the movie, the first one, was having seizures on the floor in the bathroom and came out from watching that movie because the darkness that was being released. But see, we don't see that, so we don't, uh, you know. Why don't we see it? Well, he says because you're looking at temporal things and you miss the eternal things. Hmm. I guess we got to go back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6.10. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer. All right, Jesus, we see you praying all the time to Dad, to the Father. Teach us how to pray. Okay. All right. It wasn't a 45-minute prayer. A few verses. You realize that's the only prayer they had before the scripture was written. They learned that prayer, and they recited that prayer, and one of the parts of that prayer is, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. That was the early church. They walked in that, and they took a wicked government that ruled the earth and turned it upside down. That's right, Emma. <laughs> Turned it upside down. And we're trying to build our own kingdoms here. Did you know that every nation will bow its knee? Now, Pastor, you're getting too close. Do you understand how good we are here? Pastor? Don't go there. I'm not. I'm just telling you what the word says. Every nation will bow. And out of every nation will come those who put the kingdom first. And then we get to walk before the throne, every tribe and every nation worshiping the king. Where's the rest of them? They didn't choose heaven. They chose hell. But I think if we choose heaven, my heart desire is to see hell plundered. I mean plundered. I don't think we could even imagine this. Ready for this? We pray, the kingdom comes, we're seeing experiences of God, and then we start driving around and people are in the gutters on their knees repenting. Fathers repenting to their wives and wives to their mothers and all these things going on and actual kingdom eternal things happening. But no, we have to create structures to protect children and protect the elderly because of sin. So I want his kingdom to come on earth. We're not going to get it all. Wish we could, but we won't. But then he says, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. 
you know, it was a tough time at Thanksgiving because we just didn't have the ships unloaded for Christmas. Came headlines in America. We're short of being able to buy things. See the world. What are we going to do for Christmas? How are we going to make people happy? You know, buy kids toys and they love the box. Now they're happy to take something out of the box, but they love the box, just like cats. <laughs> cats love boxes. Put a box down, you catch a cat. <laughs> Why do we worry when he says not to? Why are we concerned? That's the spirit of the world. Did you ever think the head warrior is Satan? He's worried all the time. When's he coming? All his minions worry. They don't know when. So they come along, and they get next to us. Worry, worry. And we begin to feel the supernatural, the spirit of the world, the prince of the air, because we have not lived in the eternal, which we really are. You ready? You're already eternal. You will not taste death. Now, your body may die, and then you get a new one. That's okay. Some of you younger ones don't like that, but I do. Okay? Why is it all of a sudden, have you noticed over the last four or five years, all the different movies coming out of people's testimony about going to heaven and what it was like and the miracles and, and what's heaven like and the thing? Why? Why would God begin to do that? He's going, focus, focus, focus on heaven. Then he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things shall be added to you. What things? Whatever you need. But remember the oil and gasoline and oil and water problem? You can't get anywhere. We're stuck. We're not seeing the things we should be seeing. We're seeing a little bit. See people healed. I have to think how many weeks it's been that Mike was supposed to die. October 31st. I kind of laughed the other day about that. <laughs> he told Satan to go to hell that day. <laughs> We're baptizing out front. He comes in to see somebody baptized. He confesses Christ, gets healed. On Halloween. <laughs> what was Jesus saying? Uh, uh, heaven laughs. Don't you know that? Read Psalm 2. The king laughs. Ha, ha. You guys are planning all this stuff? It breaks heaven into joy and laughter. You're going to stop what? You're going to do what, earth? Darkness, you're going to do what? Have you not seen the king? Have you not heard of his resurrected power? Have you not seen that he is alive and alive forevermore? Where do you live? So I thought, well, that's enough scripture to make my point. The Lord said, no. <laughs> so this morning he added something. So it's not going to be in your overhead. Don't panic. If you have Bibles or your phone, look it up. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3. Amazing. He dropped that into my mind when I'm sitting there praying, but I didn't write it down. If then you were raised with Christ, verse 1, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. 
Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And you died, and your life is hidden in Christ, in God. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When you read about everything that Paul went through when he, in one of his epistles where he says, I've been stoned three times, shipwrecked twice, snake bit, starved, diseased, beaten, disowned by his own people. And then he writes, what? Well, I ain't focused on that. I'm focused on that. Doesn't mean you're not going to go through stuff. <laughs> She's never noisy until she comes to church. <laughs> True. She's happy. She likes the spirit. So my message for 2022 is what are we going to be? See, I got, I, I hang on. Oh, he just popped the most scriptures in. He, I hang on to certain things that he, he's written down in his word. <laughs> and I said to him, I can imagine a lot of things, God. I can imagine a lot of things. But he says here, now to whom is able to do exceeding above, above all that we ask or think. I can't wait to get to heaven and have a conversation about that passage. I can think a lot of things. I, I was praying to say, thinking, wouldn't it be awesome that some paintings in this city would melt off of a building? Just all of a sudden, just start to run off, like just run off, and all to be a puddle of yuck. And people go, "Well, who did it? The God Almighty." They would investigate. And why do I ask that? Because we can have them do their devil stuff right in our city, and nobody cares. It's okay. No, it ain't. Why? Because I think we've been running with oil and water too long. I want the more. I'm thinking. I, I'm, I'm waiting. My prayer is that I can't get up off the floor for days because I'm meeting face to face and recognize how weak and how wrong I've been in many things. But his grace is so amazing. So I went to a scripture this morning for you guys and prayed this for you. But first I prayed it for me. Because I'm praying for more rain. Sorry, roofers. This verse came to me, and this is what I prayed for you and me. Lord, according to your word, it says, have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, holy moly. He doesn't have tender mercy. He has multitude of tender mercies. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. That's what I pray. Psalm 51. David wrote that after he blew it. Do you want a God, have a heart after God like David? You know what that means? Now, this is my interpretation. I know theologically it may not be perfect, but we'll find out. 
he knew that. He knew that about God's heart. He knew he was full of multitude of tender mercy and loving kindness. And because he knew his heart, his heart was after it. That's my definition of David's heart. He knew it. He met it out in the fields when he would play and take care of the sheep and have to kill lions, bears, and goats and all kinds of things that come against the sheep. He knew this loving kindness. He knew that when he faced Goliath, he wasn't scared because he knew God's loving kindness and tender mercy. And he goes, that uncircumcised man is not going to come against the heart of my God who's full of tender mercies. Chop, chop, went the head. He knew. And we need to know that heart of God. I do. We all do. And if we know that, and then we have someone come to this church who you hate, who's lied to you and stole from you and hurt you, or they might be a rapist or a pedophile or a drug dealer, and they're wicked. They used to worship Satan, and they come here, and we put on our religious hat, and we walk with the oil and water, and they're not walking in the goodness of God, then they'll never know the loving kindness and the tender mercies of God. You got it. I got it. Well, we can't be selfish anymore. The mercy I got, you got. We have to be ready and bend our knees and sell our soul, not to the enemy anymore, but to the goodness of God. And lay it down and say, we want more of you. We want more of you, oh God. Quit looking at the fallen world. It isn't going to get better. It isn't. It's our job to rescue the lost. That's why we're here. Until you go home, you have one call, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with everybody. What does he say in Matthew? Every living creature. I've had people bring their dogs in here for prayer. This dog came in. It couldn't move its leg. They were going to, I prayed the dog got healed. Why? It wasn't about the dog. It was about the heart of the woman who loved the dog. My wife's grandparents had a horse, and her grandma grew up on a ranch with horses, and they, they were on them all their lives. And they're still raising horses back there in South Dakota. And they had this horse, arthritis, and they dug the hole, to put the horse down. And Kristen said, go pray for the horse. I've never been around many horses. So I went and laid hands on the horse. Put my hand on its head and put my hand here. And I said, arthritis, go. Bring freedom, bring healing to the horse. I had no faith at all to do that. How many more years did the horse live? At least five more years. He probably walked by that hole in the ground going, mm-hmm. <laughs> but you know what would happen if I ever went out there to that property? That horse came to see me every time and would bow its head into my hands to let me pray. People, if horses can get it, what are we going to get it? It knew. We were praying. New Year's Day. Me and Christian, and pretty soon, we had a whole congregation around us. The dogs came. The cats came. Thank God the turtle is asleep and hibernating. And we're trying to pray, and these dogs are all getting up on us, and the cats are running and purring on. 
See, it's the spirit of heaven that they know the difference between light and darkness. We're clueless. They're not. But what if in 2022 we catch a clue? What if we really catch who we really are in him? Not what we do, what he does through us. I still, when I talk to Mike, <laughs> it isn't the healing of cancer that is so my amazing. It's the gentleness of his heart. Okay, Lord. <coughs> we have opportunity, people. We have opportunity. So when I listen to food allergies being healed and minds being healed and cancer being removed and people's backs being touched in places we can't talk about and all kinds of other healings that have taken place. <laughs> and I can get frustrated because, you know, I pray for the most. It sits right in front of me. And I'm not going to lie. I pray for people that get healed, and I go home and pray for her, and she doesn't. But I have to live in heaven. I have to stay faithful. So for every objection you got, God's got the answer. He's not afraid of your objections. You might be afraid of his answer. That's a good word right there. So I asked the Lord, what prophetic word do you want me to give them besides they feel like all beat up now and they're not doing right? You know, that's not what the message is about. It's calling you in doing right. It's behind you now. That's last year. It's behind you. Go back. You want to go back and live that mess? Huh? No, we got a new year. He's a God of new beginnings. So for, to build my faith, I just pulled one chapter out of a book I've been reading off and on. Man. And I asked God, I want to experience that. And he said, you have, but you didn't know it. This pastor was praying for this girl to be healed, a friend of his who is a pastor. And he gets word that the girl dies. And the dad never took the girl to the doctor because God told him, I will take care of it. Now, this pastor of faith who sees many miracles is very upset, going, what the heck's going on? She's dead. So he gets in a taxi, this is in 1940s, goes over to the house, this is in South Africa, and he wants to make sure she's dead. So he goes in the room, she's dead, been dead for days and days. And they get ready to bury her, they're digging the grave outside. But he said, I'm walking along with this heavy heart, and people who knew the pastor were cursing me because he didn't take her to the doctor. And say, is this the kind of faith you got? Is this who Jesus is? And he said, all of a sudden, something happened, and I have his presence on me. And I couldn't hear him anymore. I just kept walking. And I, I mean, just like in the story of Lazarus, two women come out to meet me. One said, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. The other was, had no faith. I walk in the room. And there she is. And I'm overwhelmed by the presence of God. And so what does he do? He lays on her like Elijah laid on his dead person. And as he lays on her, she begins to breathe. He slides off of her. 
Now she sits up. People were freaked out. <laughs> the mom and dad ran out of the room. She crawled over, and all she could do is lean against the wall. He was so undone by this magnificent glory and the presence, he couldn't walk for three days, the pastor, because he experienced the resurrection power in his body in a broken way. They had to bring him food for three days in bed because the pastor couldn't even get up. And the girl got stronger and stronger, and then he began to take her to other churches. And she would begin to give her testimony. And people would leave because they couldn't take the glory. They couldn't take her testimony. Now listen to that. And you know what the pastor's prayer is? Take your glory, Lord. That's all he ever prayed. Take your glory. Take your glory, Lord. So I read that. And if you saw my post, I posted Jeremiah that nothing's impossible with God for flesh. Right? And nothing's impossible with Jesus. That's where I want this year to be. That whatever stands in front of you, whatever wants to hold you back, Whatever wants to come against you, that nothing, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing God can hold back from us. Nothing. Nothing. He is king. He is Lord. It's time that we really believe in what he said. Okay. This is the word for Zion for the year. It's speaking of Israel, and this is the prophet Zechariah, chapter 2. Zechariah is having visions, and this is one of his visions. There's a measuring line that he says goes out. And I raised my eyes and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. So he said, where are you going? He said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is the width and what is the length. And from there was the angel who talked with me going out. Another angel was coming to meet him, who said to him, run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, because a multitude of men and, and livestock are in it. They've been in bondage for 70 years. They've come back. Everything's tore apart. Everything's not good. They feel no safety. Are you feeling it? Go ahead and walk the streets now at night. Okay? But then the Lord says, I will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. We experienced that a couple of weeks ago on Tuesday night. If you weren't here, because what I was experiencing, I wasn't going to allow it to be about me. I grabbed one person and said, okay, now you do it. And they walk across the front, and the fire of God was on them. At the same time, they're freezing cold. And then I grab another person, now you do it. And they walk back and forth, and every testimony was the same. The fire came. Heaven came. And what he said that night was, I'm going to remove the generational curses behind you and the shame that came with them 
and you will not have it in your life anymore. And everybody, and I'm not exaggerating, everybody was laid prostrate before the goodness of God. So yesterday he says, tell them I will be a wall of fire around you. I will be the glory in your midst. In other words, I'll be your protector. In the midst in what you do for me. What you choose? What you choose? We don't have to do it perfect. But together, holding each other up, we will see the glory. By loving like he loved one another. And loving him as he loves us. He will put a fire around your homes. He'll put a fire around this building. And he will inhabit it with his glory. What do we choose? God was faithful to us during the pandemic. He has provided beyond our expectations. He didn't provide for us to be a well-provided church. He provided for us to do the work of the gospel. Jesus says, the battle is mine. If the battle is his, and you're not in the battle, you're not with him. We have bought the lie that Christianity is without conflict. But if he is the Lord of the battle, then we walk in with him, and he wins the victory. Amen? Could you stand, please, if you could? As I prepared this, in prayer this morning, I asked the Lord, how do we do this at the end? And I don't want you to make a vow. God, don't make a vow. Oh, don't make a vow. <laughs> Scripture says, let your yes be yes, your no be no. If you agree with your hearing what God is saying for what he wants to do with you, just say yes. Don't make a promise. But my heart is that we cannot stay away from the house of God. We can't help but give him glory for the miracles he's doing in our lives. We cannot help but be in the house of God, not because it's a religious thing to do, because we're so much in love with him, because he first loved us. Did you know that we'd have... So many more people here, if I would just submit to cut worship in half. Do you know that? No, I'm serious. Pastor, I really love it, but do you know you, you go a little bit long? <laughs> and that worship, oh, my God, you know, it could go 40. It could almost do an hour, Terry. Oh, my God. <laughs> I've had them tell me over and over again. Okay, so here's the deal. I want to have as many people in here as possible, so I'm going to do what makes people happy. Bah humbug. <laughs> no way! I was delivered. I was born again. I didn't seek him. He sought me. I will not bow my knee to the spirit of man. 
and I want to bow my heart to a king who loved me when I was unlovable. That I wasn't worthy of grace, but he gave it to me. Why? Because of his love and kindness and multitude of tender mercies. I cannot give that up. It's only been 28 years. I want another 28, whatever it takes, to see God take my city and make it holy and righteous, full of glory, every Masonic curse broken, every Satanic worship broken, and that Jesus and the kids live at peace. So let's call it what it is. Hell is hell and heaven's heaven. What do you want? See, what do you want? Let's pray. He, he is so good. You knew. If only you, the only guy that knows is me and Jesus, what's been going through my mind before I preached. If you knew what was going through my mind, that's why I'm laughing. He took it all out of my mind. He took everything out that I was struggling with. Everything out that he wanted me to be angry and pissed off. Because I was pissed off. It's not good to get ready to preach and be pissed off. I'm not going to lie. But I said, no, God, no. I know what you gave me. I'm not going to take the bait. And that's why I started laughing. He went, uh. he laughed first. Hey. I took it out of your mind. <laughs> Let him take it out of your mind, whatever's been riding over the top of it. So we will, because we are a charismatic church, have an altar call, <laughs> if you so choose, to receive something, whatever you want. Not what I think you need, what you want. You ready? Jesus, we praise you for 2022. We say yes to your word and to who you are. We say yes to the treasure that you are to us. You are the treasure of our heart. May this church be known that we serve you, not ourselves. That you are glory. You are freedom. You are life. And you are the treasure of our heart. So, Lord, we lay down ourselves at your altar, and we give you glory and say, help us, Jesus, to do what we want to do. Even when we fail, pick us up. Even when we stumble, guide us back. Whatever it takes, God, we give you permission to run our lives. And when we grab the wheel, may that wheel become so electrified we can't hang on to it. You be the guiding path of our lives. May we see a healing of a city, of a county, of a region, and the darkness loses its hold over souls so that they might know the love of Jesus Christ that we all in this room have experienced. And so that's my prayer for 2022, Lord. Let the fun begin. It is fun to serve a king who loves you. It is fun to walk in the glory of God. I ask this for those here today. May you touch every heart. May you touch every mind. May you do what you want to do with them, but may they let you do it. May we not strong arm you anymore and hold our hand up and say, not too close. But may we drop our hand and say, come. I want to receive the fire that is meant for this season. I want to receive the glory that is going to fall. That the Jesus would be glorified. And everybody said, amen. The altar's open.